my name is Elizabeth Sackler, um, and welcome to the May Sackler Center for Feminist Art and the Forum. Um, we have been doing seven, we're going into our eighth year of very progressive uh, programming, excellent programming. And we have redone our website, and if you go on to brooklynmuseum.org slash EASCFA, as in the May Sackler Center, EASCFA slash video, you will be able to pull up participants by the year, by the keywords, and I think you will enjoy um, artists, writers, philosophers, activists, feminists, uh, male and female, and uh, it's, it's wonderful. So I invite you to do that. Um, not only is the Sacro Center doing beautifully, but the whole museum, as you can see, is doing wonderful. We have Swoon, we have Judy, we have On Way Away, we have Witness. Um, we are really a wonderful place for, uh, for artists and for exhibitions that address issues that we care about and that are exciting and beautiful. So I hope you have a chance, if you haven't already, um, to go around and take a look at the different exhibitions that are throughout the museum. Uh, on June 1st, Bryony Fair is coming, and she is the um, 2014 uh, Raymond uh, I'm sorry, a visiting professor at the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. And she is going to be speaking the oldest of abstractions, or can abstract art be new? And if you haven't heard Bryony speak, I really encourage you to come. She, like Gail, is brilliant. And I invited her here because I felt that her knowledge about abstract art, pre-Chicago abstract art, would add to our contextualization of Judy's early work. She's a very excited speaker, and so I would encourage you to be here. Also, of course, on June 5th, we have our Sackler Center First Awards. We honor women who are first in their fields, who have made significant contributions. And this year, we are giving the award to Anita Hill for speaking to the power. <laughs> yes, we're very excited to have Anita. We will also be screening the film, Anita. It is an evening program. Tickets are flying out the door, so I would suggest that you go online or make a phone call if you want to come and get your tickets. Um, and join us. We'll be allowed to We'll have a reception first. You'll have an opportunity to meet in the hotel, and then we will be screening uh, the film. Uh, the First Lady, Charlene um, McRae, is going to be here and make special <coughs> remarks about Anita. And uh, Gloria Steinem will be here with me to um, give her the award. So it's going to be a stir studded and very exciting evening. And so I hope you'll join us. Um, I met Gail Levin, our speaker today, in the last century. <laughs> and <laughs> we also share a birthday uh, of the same year. So in addition to having that in common, we enjoyed Asian food, which we shared upon, I think our, that was our first dinner, and discovered that we both have a passion for ethics. And uh, Gail had put together, uh, a, or had been editor, of a wonderful uh, book, Ethics and the Visual Arts, and I um, had the pleasure of writing a chapter exploring New Attitudes, which at the time was about my work uh, in repatriation of American Indian ritualistic uh, mm -hmm. material. And it's a wonderful book and still available. Gail's other book, her biography, well, one of her many books, her biography of Judy Chicago is on sale in the bookstore, and there will be a book signing with Gail afterwards downstairs in the bookstore. And um, I was thinking about Gail um, as an outstanding scholar. I was thinking of her this morning as a wonderful uh, professor. I had also the, the fortune and the privilege, actually, of uh, lecturing occasionally uh, for her courses. 
But I also determined after all the biographies that she has written that biographers are gurus. And I think uh, what it takes to do a biography of a person, aside from being a really good snoop and a first rate researcher, um, you come to know information and to understand the course of life in a way that few of us do. And even perhaps in reading a biography, we certainly have the benefit of all that is done. But it is the biographer, in fact, who is the person who um, carries it, who carries that information. And it is a pleasure for us, really, to have the opportunity to speak to us today about Judy's early works. So I will read to you her bio. Gail Levin is a distinguished professor, uh, professor of art history, American studies, and women's studies at the Graduate Center and Baruch College, CUNY. The acknowledged authority on the American realist painter, Edward Hopper. She is author of many books and articles on the artist, including the catalog Resume and Edward Hopper, an intimate biography. Her work on 20th century and contemporary art has been widely published and translated. Her articles cover a wide range from the theory of artist biographies to explorations of the intersection of American and Asian cultures. She has also focused on the art of Jewish women artists in historical cultural context. In 2007, she co-organized the show Judy Chicago, Jewish Identity at Hebrew Union College and is the author of biographies on Judy Chicago and Lee Krasner and her most recent project, Teresa Bernstein, A Century in Art, includes a book, a comprehensive website, and a touring exhibition of Bernstein's art. Now you know why I say mm. <laughs> Levin's work has won international acclaim and her scholarship has been recognized by grants from NEH, the Fulbright Association, the Smithsonian Institution, the Rockefeller Foundation, Brandeis, Harvard, and Yale Universities, among many others. She has lectured internationally, including the U.S. State Department. Levin also publishes and exhibits her own photography and collages, and right now a show of her collage memoir which is called On Not Becoming an Artist, is on view through May 27th at the National Association of Women Artists in Manhattan. And I really encourage you to go. There will be also a closing reception of that uh, exhibition on May 27th from 3 to 5. And Gail Levin, the artist, the not artist, will be there. I think Gail uh, won't, won't talk about it today, but she has shared with me, as may be true for many of us, that she was discouraged by parents, some of us discouraged by teachers, others discouraged by children, others discouraged by all kinds of things, with the notion that we are not artists. And Gail finally took the leap and has produced the body of work which is now on exhibition. So in addition to being a uh, biographer guru, please welcome artist Gail Levin. Researching and writing about Judy Chicago was um, very influential on my perspective in the art world. And um, one of the great um, experiences in that research was getting to know Liz Sackler. And I, I might add, getting to know Judy Chicago, whose um, motivation and energy and intelligence uh, no, no equal. So I'd like to share with you today my perspective um, and look at her career in cultural context. So I'll be looking at um, many of, some of her contemporaries, most of them male, but some of them female, and also the politics of her oops, life and times. I won't be needing that. I have been suffering um, since Wednesday from laryngitis. 
So I have with me um, a written text, which I will refer to. But if my voice runs out, um, I have my husband poised to take over and read it, and I'll just make small comments. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll move the slides. So we will have a lecture. I did not want to be a no-show, and I'm really glad you turned up, and thank you for your interest. So I want to start in autumn 1957 when Judy Cohen from Chicago entered um, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles to major in art. She threw herself into political and social activism. She promptly attracted the attention of the FBI, as I learned when I was researching her biography. Um, and uh, more, she had only a small file, but the FBI was really quite interested in her father, Arthur Cohen. You see Judy at age 13, and that's her father. He had been a communist labor organizer working in the Chicago Post Office. He, he refused to sign a loyalty oath, and the ensuing FBI investigation led him to quit his job in the Post Office and hastened his death in 1953, when Judy was only 13, old enough to have imbibed his concerns for social welfare, and young enough not to have felt the need for teenage rebellion. I just couldn't resist this um, photograph of Judy, age 13, and earlier work than is in the current show, which is really quite wonderful, but doesn't go back this far, from Elizabeth Sackler's collection. I think Judy was only uh, five years old when she made this finger painting. She was very talented early on. This was recognized, uh, her mother, May uh, Cohen took her to the Art Institute of Chicago's junior school, first the little, the school for little kids, but then she was winning lots of awards in the junior school. <coughs> Judy then was a so-called red diaper baby, um, meaning having communist parents, or father certainly, and she took to heart the lessons of her radical parents, they were both radical, that the fate of the world is not something to be trusted to authorities. Red diaper babies are said to have been especially wary of being intimidated, since their passivity could confirm their parents' defeats. Going back in time, Judy's paternal grandfather, uh, Arthur's father, Rabbi Benjamin Cohen, who immigrated to the United States from Kavna, now Kaunas, Lithuania, uh, followed Judaic humanism, which is acknowledged to contain potentially radical values. And he, he did pass them on to his children, especially his youngest son, Arthur. And so when Arthur finished high school at the age of 16, he had to go to work to support himself. Um, he managed to get hired as a substitute postal clerk, working nights at the Chicago Post Office. They called it our university. Among his fellow workers on the night shift, and this is sorting mail, right, were Arthur Goldberg, the future labor secretary and Supreme Court justice, uh, and Richard Wright, the African-American novelist, who writes about these experiences and the racism in the post office, which Arthur worked to eliminate, um, in um, a book published posthumously called Law Lord Today, which is here on the screen. At the time of the stock market crash in October 1929, when the overwhelming economic turndown took its toll, radical politics made much more sense than religion to Arthur, who was just 20. It was probably at this moment of economic collapse that Arthur Cohen found the American Communist Party, um, which at the time championed the unemployed, protested evictions and cuts in relief aid, and uh, led hunger marches. There were hunger lines. And often this was through, in the 1930s, through the Popular Front. So after the 20s, the Communist Party was more demure. And um, 
it made alliances with liberal organizations. And actually, I'm showing you a, a 1935 communist uh, magazine for children uh, called The New Pioneer. And it's, I just discovered this by um, Mitchell Saporin, who uh, was a friend in Chicago, an artist, a friend in Chicago of Arthur Cohen. Well, I was really interested in that. Um, so in the 30s, the Communist Party and its sympathizers grew in numbers right up until the Hitler-Stalin non-aggression pact in 1939, when it started to shrink. Arthur basically exchanged one orthodoxy for another, his father's for Marxism. And here you see a, um, co a communist, um, that's 1929, a demonstration. I couldn't find a photo of one in Chicago, but that one's in New York. Um, so Arthur may have rejected his father's religious calling, he certainly did, but not the clear humanitarian goals that his father drew from something called the Musar movement, uh, the yeshiva where he studied in Kaunas, um, founded that movement. And it comes away, the takeaway is the desire to make the world a better place, to go out and repair the world. And I think Judy uh, really feels that legacy. She never forgot the lesson, um, though she rejected her father's political ideas um, in terms of the Communist Party. Um, she moves on to, um, well, she does work against racism during the civil rights movement, as you'll see, and she moves on to the feminist movement. So from Chicago's, <clears throat> excuse me, already as a UCLA freshman, uh, Judy was attracted to socialist groups and she became the corresponding secretary of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People at UCLA, for whom she made posters, none of which, as far as I know, have ever been found. So this early commitment anticipates her later activism. Once in LA, Judy no doubt heard about so we're in the fall of 1957 when she arrives in September or late August. And in June, the previous June, this um, artist called Wallace Berman got arrested at the Ferris Gallery um, and, and made, made the news. And um, this is his later work. Just wanna go back for a second. I don't know if you can see it, but there's um, hanging on the right side of the cross are couples supposedly having sexual intercourse. You can see it a little bit better on his um, 19, uh, 10 years later on this piece. Um, so he settled down in Topanga Canyon, which is where Judy will eventually be living, where, where when he was living there. Um, so he was there in 1963. And this is the Ferris Gallery, where um, also Edward, Edward Keenholz had a one-man show in 1962. And um, it featured an, an installation called Roxy's. Now, you may be wondering, what does this have to do with Judy Chicago? Well, everything, because Judy is one of the first female artists to deal with sexuality, and it was deemed so radical and so, um, well, I can remember the initial reaction to the plates on the dinner party. I mean, you've got to put yourself back to the time when vagina wasn't allowed as a word in the New York Times. There was no vagina monologues. You've got to go back in a time machine. So for Judy, she really grew up in Los Angeles with Wallace Berman's uh, being arrested. And being arrested is really great for an artist because it's a lot of attention in the press. Okay, and Judy uh, intuited very early on how to get that attention, as I will point out. 
So Roxy's shows a prostitute on a sewing machine table so that when you hit the pedal, you could vibrate her gyre, she would gyrate up and down as if she were having sex. But this time, the city authorities, because this is in greater LA, in the city of LA, they ignored the provocation. It's, so there, there is the original. And the Ferris Gallery boys, Judy speaks about them. She wanted to be one of the boys, but it was virtually impossible. And they are, you can see, um, people like Ed Keenholz, whom I mentioned, Robert Irwin, who actually attended Judy's senior show at UCLA, um, Billy Al Bangston, and I'll talk about him momentarily, Craig Kaufman, Ed Moses. Um, so this is a group which were boys, wild men, they had no women, and Judy wanted in. Now, just to tell you how radical was radical, at UCLA in 1957-58, when Judy's freshman year, if you organized a Pete Seeger con uh, concert on campus, you'd get thrown out of school. That was too radical. For example, um, you see here Pete Seeger two years earlier than Judy's freshman year testifying before the House Committee on Un-American Activities. And Pete Seeger has just passed, and we celebrate him and his social activism. But at the time, certainly the FBI considered him way, way too radical. So from the moment Judy begins at UCLA, she is drawn to the civil rights movement, as I mentioned. The FBI file in her chronicles her involvement with you know, typical radical student groups. Um, nothing so out of the ordinary, but she's certainly following in her father's footsteps, and the FBI knew that she was her father's daughter. Okay. So we have Judy's, uh, or at least I had, Judy's letters home to her mother from college. We find her focusing on existential literature and philosophy. She made Phi Beta Kappa, actually. Um, these were intellectual sources for many of her generation of the new left. And the lesson of her parents' generation was that the fate of the world is not something to be entrusted to authorities. Um, it becomes increasingly clear from her formative years that Chicago was determined to change history. Looking back years later, she recalled, when I got out of college, I moved into serious art making, being affected by abstract expressionism and minimal art. I developed as an artist, but I was not satisfied because I felt I was only using part of myself. You know, there was no model for making art as a woman except a degrading one, you know, ladies painting. And um, since I know so well Edward Hopper, who is married to Josephine Hopper, the painter, I will remind you that he specifically denigrated all women artists, but especially, quote, lady flower painters. And Judy intuited that kind of prejudice, and she didn't want to be one. Um, so when she does through the flower, it's something else altogether. <laughs> Not what Hopper meant by lady flower painting. We'll get there. So um, she makes a trip to New York City. She and uh, Jerry Garowitz, whom she's going to eventually marry, hitchhiked across from LA. She takes a year off from college. And um, she signs up to study painting with a man I knew, an artist I knew, um, and had interviewed because he, he painted Edward Hopper, and that's Raphael Sawyer. And Judy was not impressed. He was not her cup of tea, you could say. Um, she was very turned on, however, by the abstract expressionist. And the, when she was in New York, the Guggenheim Museum and the Frank Lloyd Wright Building just opened. She... Um, painted these two works that remain in one of her sketchbooks and show her interest in abstract art at that time. And this is Jerry Garowitz and her portrait of him. She married him um, in the spring of 1961. 
and he died in a car crash off Topanga Canyon where Wallace Berman was living in 1963. Chicago struggled to put her life back together. That's his portrait with a beard in the background. She resumed graduate studies that fall at UCLA, working as a teaching assistant. She took two courses on painting and one on sculpture. Her painting professors um, were Sam Amato and Elliot Elgard, who saw Judy Garowitz, as she then became known, Judy Garowitz, Judy Cohen, Judy Garowitz, Judy Cohen Garowitz, right, she became. Um, and they, her teachers saw her painting abstract and ambitiously on large masonite panels, often as large as eight by four feet. Perhaps they were puzzled by her abstract yet biomorphic imagery, which came directly out of the emotional turmoil of a young widow. So look at this, do you see her broken heart? And do you see the phallus representing uh, her loss of her husband 10 years after her loss of her father. It's painted in a colorful, hard-edged style, which she began, um, she began, however, making recognizable references to what she called phalluses, vaginas, testicles, wombs, hearts, ovaries, and other body parts. The first one, here is called bigamy, so it's her imagination of her loyalty to her dead father and her loyalty to her now dead husband. So thus she has a double vagina heart form, the, uh, a broken heart and a frozen phallus. She said the subject matter was the double death of my father and my husband, and the phallus was stopped in flight and prevented from uniting with the vaginal form by an inert space. It's certainly a, an original take. And another one of her paintings from this time is called Flight. It includes a butterfly below and on the top a double cross referring to the the twin deaths of her father and her, her husband. And she called um, a third large panel painting, Birth, um, also from 1963, echoing the title and the theme of a now well-known abstract expressionist composition by Jackson Pollock from around 1938 to 41, which was reproduced in Frank O'Hara's early monograph on Pollock published in 1959, coinciding with Judy's stay in New York and her developing interest in abstract expressionism. Her image showed pelvic ovarian womb and heart shapes in bright hard edge patterns, despite the fact that men like Pollock had previously painted such anatomical motifs her work met with dismay by her instructors who gave her Bs, not a positive grade for graduate work. She later recounted how her male instructors felt uncomfortable with her female images and made her feel that there was something wrong with her. They even threatened to throw her out of graduate school. And this one in the exhibition, Mother Superette, an acrylic abstraction on paper, about which one professor remarked disdainfully, quote, it looks like breast and wombs. These negative comments led Chicago, then called Garowitz, to try to suppress personal comment in her work. Although this discourse took place in the early 1960s, her male instructors responded to a powerful residue from the 1950s when the link between the twin dangers of women's uncontrolled sexuality and atomic power became established and marked popular culture from the use of the term bombshell as slang for a sexy woman to the abbreviated two-piece swimsuits named for the Bikini Islands, where a bomb dropped during the Second World War was said to have been decorated with a photo of a Hollywood sex symbol. That's a female sex symbol. 
But since the 1950s, the old double standard that required premarital chastity for women only was giving way to sexual liberalism. Playboy magazine had published a roundtable discussion in 1962 in which Alexander King, an editor for Life magazine, argued, quote, the assumption that a woman is supposed to get something out of her sexual content, contact, something joyful and satisfactory, is a very recent idea. But this idea has been carried too far. It's becoming so that women are sitting like district attorneys to see what, whether, what the man can or cannot perform. And this has put men tremendously on the defensive. It's a mistake, because democracy is all right politically, but it's no good in the home, end quote. So just to remind you of women's activism at the time, there's Bella Abzug in the Women's Strike for Peace and the call to ban nuclear testing in 1962. Bella, our New York City politician. And our, another New York City feminist, Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, published in 1963. And I have to say, Judy Chicago didn't need it. But a lot of other women did. So years later, Penthouse magazine that would report that because the imagery in many early paintings and sculptures uh, of, of Judy Ch Chicago were so overtly vaginal and feminism, her male colleagues began referring to them as Judy's cunts. Such remarks horrified Chicago then, and for several years she cooled down her directly genital imagery, producing abstracts. And I noticed some of the abstracts in the show are actually called cunts um, by Judy now. So um, this is a, a show. Um, one of the few uh, installation shots in which you can see the little in the box here uh, called the, the far box, um, in my mother's house, a now lost sculpture, probably destroyed, um, by Judy Chicago. And next to it, one, so you get an idea of her color at the time. Um, sometime we need a much bigger early Judy Chicago show because there's a lot of work. That's really fascinating. But here she's showing with the artist Ron Davis at the Rolf Nelson Gallery in a group show. And there in the background, you see her painting Flight that I showed you in color as well. And I, I want to point out that in Los Angeles, there was a, th um, a school, as it were, a, a group of artists like Carl Benjamin and John McLaughlin older than Judy, who painted hard edge, clean edge, colored abstraction. And that, I think, has did have an impact on all people studying art in LA, including Judy. So um, we could see her color and the crisp edges is coming out of that. And then I'm just going to show you. Um, this is her friend, Lloyd Hamrell whom would become later her second husband, but was her buddy in art school after, um, and, and Garowitz is now dead, of course. And she's going by the name Garowitz, and Garowitz came from LA, Judy from Chicago, and everybody thought she was Garowitz's, the Garowitz couple's daughter, which she didn't like. And here is one of those sculptures from this period with pink feathers. And look at the twisting forms. It's more like an abstract expressionist painting than it is like one of those geometric uh, LA paintings. And um, another one of those paintings. I think I don't have a title for it. And these are these plaster uh, painted sculptures. And again, Lloyd Hamrell's and one of Judy's, which has almost Picasso-like stippling on it, those little dots. It reminds me of his glass of absinthe. Judy is nothing um, but well-informed about the history of art, and one of the first to become informed about the history of women artists. So in Art Forum magazine, which was then published in LA, 
um, Judy's In My Mother's House on the left, which you saw exhibited there at the Rolf Nelson Gallery, was reproduced next to Lloyd Hamrell's uh, TF. And um, I think the motifs on the dinner party plates, the um, female genitalia motifs are already quite evident in my mother's house. House being metaphoric. Where the babies come from. Oh, it's not plaster, I misspoke, it's clay. It's painted clay. So making the pages of Art Forum, um, and Judy did it more than once, um, was indicative of her um, ability to attract the press. Um, it was mentioned um, that she worked with an organic sexuality rendered in painted plaster. Oh, that's where I got the painted plaster from, Art Forum. And um, like the color form idea, so I'm reading from a review, um, and it says, one senses almost spontaneous abandon in selection. And um, this is a female reviewer writing, by the way. And um, she mentions, for the most part, of talking about Garowitz's work, they um, create fascinating tensions. And, well, so um, at the same time here that Judy is showing this uh, vaginal sort of metaphoric form, um, she is friendly with, um, you can come sit down, then you don't have to stand. Um, she's friendly with um, a group of artists showing in Venice, uh, California, um, who were, became known as the Venice Boys. And some of them, like Billy Al Bankston and um, Ed Moses, uh, came right out of the Ferris Boys. And um, so this is the group Judy wants to show with. And there's uh, Billy Al with Irving Blum of Ferris Gallery and what Billy Al is doing. And notice his um, forms, including the hard form, which we've seen Judy use, and the poster for the Ferris Gallery. And this mindset, the studs, they have a group show called The Studs. How many women artists are going to be in that? Zero. So I interviewed Billy Al Bankston to see what he would tell me about Judy Chicago um, in these years. And uh, he actually was quite willing to be interviewed, but then he told me, you can say any, this is for the biography, you can say anything you want. He said, just make it up. But he was miffed because he said Judy had stolen his idea. Well. You can see the symbol, the, the um, relationship, but it hardly looks like a stolen idea to me. But Judy did manage to get a lot of attention. And um, yeah, there's the relationship. I'd say she takes it to another realm, wouldn't you? So here are the Venice boys on vacation. And Ken Price, I thought it would be interesting to look at his work, um, another Los Angeles artist, because of the hard edge and the, the way it's painted clay um, related to Judy, Judy's work. And another one of her friends is Larry Bell, who's related to um, Robert Irwin and James Terrell and the whole light color. Um, movement in Southern California, and Judy was quite good friends with Larry Bell, who will make a, a cameo appearance in her women's art program, which became the feminist art program at Cal State Fresno, um, when sh uh, she's doing radical things. So that's Larry Bell's work. And this is um, the context in which you can see these marvelous paintings that Judy did. Um, like Fresno Fan and uh, the Pasadena Lightsavers. The ones, on, the ones that are on plexiglass, though, with the luminosity are, I think, related to this work. I don't say derivative from it, because they're very original, but they're all part of that 
um, mindset in Southern California. And Robert Irwin, um, and as I said, he actually showed up at Judy's um, ML, uh, master's show, and uh, that was a really important thing to have him show up. She was very, very happy about that, being recognized. Now, I want to point out that in Southern California, you've got the whole great boycott going on in um, 1965. I remember hearing about it when I was just beginning college on the East Coast, but it's right out there on the West Coast. So Judy is very aware about these social protest movements, including the Black Panthers um, and their violence on posters. So this is um, in the context also of uh, riots in uh, ghettos of African Americans in the 60s. And now I'm showing the work of Via Selmans, who was Judy's um, fellow art student at UCLA. At the same time, they were there. And uh, this is when Judy's doing all those anatomical forms, the bigamy painting I showed you, Selman's is doing a gun firing. And uh, a hot pan, a hot plate, a hot frying pan. And later she calms down with her ocean uh, paintings and drawings. But she also made a box with um, plastic puzzle and a fur-lined top, and I think that's very much related to Judy's games set, which are in the show. And it's also related to Merritt Oppenheim's fur-lined teacup, which is at MoMA, and very famous. Uh, Merritt Oppenheim was a woman artist, so very famous to all up-and-coming women artists. But more important is the physical fact of LA. Remember, Judy comes from Chicago, where she would take uh, public transportation, and suddenly she's in a city where the car rules and the highway. And the style is called fetish finish. In the 1960s, Los Angeles um, automobile fans decorated their cars, and this in turn influenced artists. And we have Ed Ruscha, who is one of the Ferris boys, showing in 1962 a little book of prints of um, 26 gas stations, gasoline stations, uh, later. Oh, and at the same time, he also does this somewhat Hopper-esque um, standard oil gas station based on one of the images in his book. And Joe Good, another artist Judy was friendly with, did a whole calendar with every month a car image. So then we get to Judy Chicago's Car Hood from 1964. And this is recently bought at auction in the last few years by the Moderna Museet in Stockholm, Sweden. And Judy went in order to paint this to auto body school, auto painting school, where she learned to put on spray paint. And she attended with Lloyd Hamrell. She was the only woman you can imagine in the class. And um, she said, they made me wear a Mother Hubbard type of smock. She says a lot more, but I'm going to let you read it in my biography. Um, but she. Um, said that the vaginal form on this car hood, penetrated by a phallic arrow, um, was a very clear symbol of my state of mind at the time. And she said also, I put my very sexually feminine images on this car hood, which is in itself quite a symbol. Over the next few years, I retreated from that kind of subject matter because it had been met with great ridicule. So there was no radical departure, she says, just a slow moving away from content-oriented work to a more formalist stance, and then, much later, a slow moving back. And I think she really sums up what we can see in her work there. And she was able to show Carr Hood um, in 1965 with a lot of uh, the male artists at the, in a group show at the La Jolla Museum 
which had only six uh, other women. Judy had a lot of good fortune in being recognized in showing this early work. Um, he, she began to, uh, she also went to boat building school where she learned to cast in fiberglass. She was absolutely fearless. There was a technique she wanted to know, she just went about learning it. And um, she thought the fiberglass pieces would be clean, simpler, sprayed, and look like me, she wrote. She was so broke then that she was faced with finding a job for a month so she could afford to buy a spray gun and a compressor. So um, here is the work from her first solo show at the Rolf Nelson Gallery in Los Angeles, which opened in January 1966, and she earned positive reviews in Art Forum, where her friend John Copeland's was editor, and in Art News, uh, which was edited out of New York. Um, her show was presented in two sequential installations. The first was called Sunset Squares, which you see here, and they could be rearranged, as you see. And the second was called Rainbow Picket and is outside here in painted wood. Judy didn't, wasn't able to preserve all of this early work because it's expensive to house all of this. And she wasn't able to sell it when she first made it. That's a different story today. So Rainbow Picket, which is outside here, was actually named, according to Judy, for the African-American soul music performer um, Wilson Pickett. And um, I think the rainbow is Judy's uh, maybe allusion to the Rainbow Coalition and to the civil rights movement uh, avant la lettre, before it became common sp uh, speak. But it's been written about as if she wrote picket with one T, as if a picket fence, and it's definitely not that. But what struck me recently is that this all happens in the context in Los Angeles of the Watts riot of African Americans living in poverty and that Judy is making allusions to that in the complexity of her choices. However, she said, um, I'm looking for a way to make sculpture as direct as a Frank Stella painting. I'm finished with the kind of surface and craft preoccupation of the Ferris boys. And uh, Peter Plagans, who reviewed, um, is thought that her Sunset Squares, this one, um, was, um, its own man, he said, so to speak, but who has been freely ingesting um, the work of, say, Robert Morris, and I'm showing you here, Donald Judd, and who in turn, the men, owe a great deal to the later sculpture of David Smith and a few painters. But he found fault in what he called a touch of elegance in the assignment of its floor positions when he said it should just plunk be there. The next month he reviewed Rainbow Picket. He found it more engaging, but claimed it lost some of the vulgar power of the squares because of the sweet flatness of color, usurped effectiveness of the physical form. But I think it's the pastel colors that separate it from what the guys were doing and make it so original. And um, I think it stands up very well. Now here is Judy. Garowitz, posing with the work also in the show, but um, you'll notice on the label she now calls it Trinity, though in the archival photograph across the way, she does mention that she originally called it Lilith. And um, by, by naming her sculpture after Lilith, an aspect of a great goddess who was demonized for being an independent female, she calls attention to this Sumerian goddess of more than 2,000 years be, um, ago and to the con, uh, who became the consort of God in Kabbalism as late as the 18th century. 
Having experienced negative stereotypes of women far too often, Garowitz may have found attractive the subversive image of the beautiful seductress who joined lonely men in their nocturnal unrest, enjoyed sex with them, and bore them demonic offspring. So there is a medieval reference to Lilith as the first wife of Adam, which portrays her as refusing to assume a subservient role to Adam during sexual intercourse and deserting him, going on to mate with other demons. God answering Adam's plea to bring Lilith back sent three angels in pursuit of her. And this led to the practice of protecting a mother and her newborn child from Lilith with the help of three angels. Thus, this is the link to the name Garowitz chose for her sculpture with its three forms, which ironically she seems to have forgotten when she renamed the piece Trinity and showed it in the big minimal art show at Los Angeles MoCA in 2004. Um, so she's resisted returning the piece to its original title, which I like much better. In 1966, here you see her again, um, Garowitz began to uh, produce temporary collaborative works. She was working together with um, Lloyd Hamrell and um, sometimes another male artist. She sought, she said, to move the art out of the studio and into the industrial environment. And to do so, she made minimal look like looking compositions, but she made them out of dry ice. So they were instantly vaporizing and disappearing. And um, she stressed in an interview that technology was um, not a means to an end, and only by moving out of the studio into the factory and ultimately into suitable public spaces can the artist hope to affect society. And this early commitment to affect society, I think, goes right to her earlier work in the civil rights movement and uh, her consciousness of her father's teachings. So there you, oh, Eric Orr is one of the other collaborators. And they made uh, Time Magazine. Then um, Judy with the same group is collaborating. They uh, rent the old Ralph Nelson is now closest gallery. They rent the space and they fill it with feathers, chicken feathers, and create an environment. And um, they got very good press. And they said that only by controlling the environment um, could they uh, really reach their peak uh, effect. But the Pasadena art newspaper, and this shows you Judy's knack, um, reviewed it with the caption, girl with pluck. Pasadena artist Judy Garowitz surveys her plastic wall chicken feather room. And they claimed the group, um, it was Hamrell, Eric Orr, and Roger Zimmerman, and of course Garowitz, that they were um, working on the environmental movement in art, which seeks to create an environment um, which envelops and involves the spectator rather than let the spectator be passive uh, in order to appreciate the work. And there you see the girl with pluck. Well, at the same time now, the Vietnam War is getting into high gear. And uh, together with Lloyd Hamrell and Mark de Suvero, our New York artist now, uh, Judy worked on a very famous protest against the Vietnam War, um, erecting a peace tower right in LA at La Cienega and Sunset Boulevards in Hollywood, a tubular steel structure surrounded by panels by 400 artists, including Eva Hesse, John, Don Judd, Roy Lichtenstein, James Rosenquist, Nancy Sparrow. 
and yet Garowitz's anti-war activities are pretty much eclipsed by what would follow. But long a couple, she and Lloyd Hamrell married that summer, but she did not take his name. She stayed Judy Garowitz. She began teaching, oh so, there you see her with Mark de Suvero and Lloyd Hamrell in the background. And there, uh, Hamrell, uh, no, sorry. Um, de Suvero goes up to uh, British Columbia. He goes to Canada like many anti-war protesters and Judy and Lloyd go up to visit him. And this is a photo taken by Lloyd when they're out off uh, Vancouver just to remind you of the massive demonstrations against the war. And a 1967 film, which I think is re related to Judy's work, and uh, that's The Graduate. Did, didn't any of you see it? And do you remember when they ask him what he's gonna do after graduation? You remember what he says? Plastics. And what is Judy working in at this time? Plastics. It was very big in LA. Presumably the film was made. So we have the plastic of Robert Irwin, and we have Judy's domes, which are in the exhibition. And of course, they have anatomical references for Judy. We have her game pieces, which are also acrylic, a kind of plastic. And we have her male contemporaries, like Craig Kaufman, also working in LA with plastic. Um, and I'll remind you of the Miss America pageant um, and the protest uh, outside of the sexism in 1968 and inside some of the uh, protesters uh, pr protesting the Vietnam War. And I want to remind you that um, very radical feminists uh, somewhat disturbed Valerie Solanas, who spoke out in her book the Scum Manifesto, the Society for Cutting Up Men Manifesto against the absence of women, great women artists. Uh, of course, attacks Andy Warhol, who did manage to survive. So things are getting very out of hand. Uh, it's a time of violence with the assassination of Robert Kennedy, of following JFK, and of Martin Luther King, very tragic time in American history more protests against the war. Uh, Edward Keenholz, who was doing the sexuality at Roxy's, has now made the Portable War Memorial based on the Joe Rosenthal photograph. And Judy um, comes up with the idea that she's going to uh, make atmospheres and feminize the environment through smoke pieces, which she did in 1969 at Brookside Park in Pasadena, uh, which she later described as flares of colored smoke out of doors and the landscape. They're all about the releasing of energy. And she also stated that her aim was to transform and soften, feminize the environment. And um, these link to her paintings in the show, The Pasadena Lifesavers. And she performed at the, um, an atmosphere at the Pasadena Art Museum in 1969. These are some historic photographs and recently recreated uh, one of her pieces here in Brooklyn. And again, um, some have viewed her atmospheres as linking to the Southern California light and space movement, including works such as Robert Irwin seen here. And these are the Pasadena Lifesavers that are um, similar to, or if not the exact ones in the show. By then, um, she has Kate Millett um, uh, publishing her book, uh, Sexual Politics. Kate Millett is also a sculptor. And this is the Alice Neal portrait of Kate Millett. Uh, and Alice Neal comes into Judy's life as one of the supporters of bringing the dinner party a bit later to Brooklyn. Okay. Um, Judy began teaching at Fresno State College in January 1970, and not long after she decided to change her name from Judy Garowitz 
to Judy Chicago. Her dealer um, in LA used to call her Judy from Chicago, and it's the time of Wanda West Coast in Robert, Indiana, and she had this and still has a bit of a Chicago accent. Um, so the steps seemed very reasonable. She did it legally, and she, the, um, she got a friend, the photographer Jerry McMillan, uh, who had the idea to document her name change with her posing as a boxer and set it up at a real um, uh, boxing ring. And um, that became the announcement of her show at Cal State Fullerton and also an ad in December uh, 1970 Art Forum. And she uh, had two ads in the other one uh, earlier, October, she, uh, Judy Garowitz, and this is in the show, hereby divest herself of all names imposed upon her through male social dominance and freely chooses her own name, Judy Chicago. So her name change announcement. She began her pioneering art program for women that autumn. Um, she had a growing sense that dominant male attitudes inhibited women from expressing their female perspective in art. And so she got permission to take her class off campus uh, to a separate study space just for women. And she had 15 recruits, and, it, um, and they wanted to um, escape the presence and expectations of men. She wanted to turn women artists into artists and not artist wives and the mistresses of artists, which is what they usually became. Now she ran into, here you see the, the girls doing a performance, there was a lot of performance art there, called the Cock and Cunt Play, which Judy wrote, and which is in the appendix to her memoir, Through the Flower. And this was a collaborative work, which I really love, um, in which they spoof the Miss America and beauty pageants in the United States, but it's Miss Chicago and the California girls. But she um, ran into problems because there was a lot of consciousness raising and psychological exploration. So she calls in an older woman artist that she thinks is going to help her, and that's Miriam Shapiro, whom you see here. And Miriam visits CalArts, and the girls who do a lot of performance dress her up as a Victorian woman and take this photograph, which she later used on an exhibition uh, catalog. It's a photo by the artist Dory Atlantis, who was in the class in Fresno. And Judy takes as many of the women who want to go to CalArts with her, and, uh, but here you see them still performing in Fresno. This is before Cindy Sherman, that they're dressing up and taking photographs of themselves. And there is a very famous rap weekend at the end of the year in April, 1971, and for that, uh, Miriam Shapiro with her husband, the Dean of CalArts, Paul Brock, attend, along with, you see, the late Paula Harper, an art historian. And Judy and Miriam come up with the idea to move Judy's program of feminist teaching for artists to CalArts and call it the Feminist Art Program. And Paula Harper has the idea that they should transform a house and interrogate the life of the housewife. Um, but in the meantime, I want to show you what Judy's painting, which is in the exhibition, and I don't think you would ever know it just to look at this painting. It's just luscious, beautiful, colored light, very Southern California. But it's happening, Fresno fans, at exactly the same time that she and her students and Miriam Shapiro and some other artists like Wanda West Coast are doing Woman House, transforming a house about to be demolished. She makes all of the girls, both in Fresno and LA, wear combat boots and learn construction skills, very useful for being an artist. And <clears throat> lots more performance. There's the nurture and kitchen where the eggs morph into breast. And the different artists, um, they, they got national publicity. There's the linen closet, the bridal staircase, et cetera, and the menstruation bathroom, which is Judy's own contribution to Woman House. They had over 10,000 visitors in the few weeks it remained open, just over a month. But Judy 
is doing those abstract paintings. She's also, by the next year, doing these much more radical offset lithographs. And um, I think you can relate it to menstruation bathroom, but also to Via, via Selman's and the um, radical uh, Black Panther's use of gun imagery. Judy and Miriam speak at the Corcoran Conference for Women, and Judy meets Arlene Raven at this conference. She renames Arlene Rubin Arlene Raven, and Raven moves to work with Judy Chicago, and there she is uh, on the left. Um, and they found, eventually, the Women's Building in Los Angeles, and there you see with Sheila de Bretville, and they have the Women's Studio Workshop, Sheila de Bretville um, is there on, in the left, and Arlene Raven over here on the right. And Sheila um, was graphic, is a graphic designer. And the, the women's building and the women's studio workshop were very, very significant in their influence at the time. So there's Judy with Lloyd Hamrell, with whom she, to whom she is now married. And we have in the show from the Great Ladies series. Um, we have Queen Victoria and Christina, Queen Christina. Now these seem just to be abstract paintings, but she's getting back to her uh, physical imagery. And she does a reincarnation triptych as well, which emphasizes um, autobiography, um, History, Biography, and Autobiography in 1973. Judy is one of the best read artists. I think she allowed me, um, or cooperated on her biography because she's a fan of biographies, which she was reading to find out about women in history. Um, she's uh, extremely well read, and there are references to biography then in that piece. Well, let it all hang out is, um, is this one in the show? I, not, not in the show. But it, um, a related work is in the show, which is I'm going to show you momentarily. But this is, I think, quite related to women's, her interest in women's anatomy and sexuality, which is widespread now. And there is a very famous book, some of you may know it, Our Bodies, Ourselves, which came out in a second edition in 1973. And that's what Judy was after here. Um, and um, Barbara Smith in Women's Space Magazine said, wrote, quote, this seems to be a most ecstatic, orgasmic image, more expressive than anything I've seen of hers. So this one is in the show. Heaven is for white men only, also from 1973. And Judy did have um, earlier at UCLA an Africa, a very important African-American boyfriend who was, also wrote a memoir. And it's very interesting to compare their memoirs uh, of each other, which I do in the biography. And her um, series of rejection drawings, peeling back. And we get to Through the Flower, which is in the show and which she chose for the cover of Through the Flower, her memoir, first published in 1975, where she was um, encouraged by a mentor, an Anais Neen, who's uh, famous, uh, we published The Delta of Venus. I, I will say Judy goes to Europe and she visits the Matisse Chapel and the Picasso Museum and she decides she wants something as ambitious as Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel, and she's already now coming up with ideas about women in theater for what is going to become the dinner party, and she starts to do, to study a new uh, technique, China painting, which has been done by women. And uh, basically, we end up with the dinner party where she is thinking about Leonardo's Last Supper and the Last Supper, but from the point of view of the women whom she said did the cooking. 
but I think that the Last Supper is also, of course, a Seder, the Jewish Passover Seder. And this is a photograph Judy saved of her um, father's family. That's her father, Arthur Cohen, with the little boy, second from the right, with the little cap on, and all Judy's aunts and uncles. And this uh, rem is a treasure that remains with her. And so we can remember Judy wanted the plates at the last wing of the dinner party to rise up in liberation because the Jews are liberated from being slaves in Egypt to being free. But it's also women who needed to be emancipated. And so that becomes the theme of the dinner party. And you can see how it interrelates to um, you can see exactly how it interrelates with Judy's connection to her father, to social activism. I see it as uh, an unbroken movement forward. Thank you very much. If you have questions, I'll answer. Yeah, if you, anyone has questions. Gail is available to answer questions. Don't forget that there will be a book signing downstairs uh, afterwards. This was absolutely terrific, Gail. Thank you very much. The contextualization was really extraordinary. Thank you. Let me just take this down. Um, I want to mention that if you'd like to be more involved with the Sackler Center, you can join the uh, Center for Feminist Arts, uh, the, Cur uh, the Council for Feminist Arts. And we have uh, brochures on the back, at the back there, with Jess, who is our program coordinator. And thank you, Jess. And this is a postcard also back there, which will give you an image of the work that uh, Gail has now uh, on exhibition downtown. This was really superb, Gail. I thank you very much. And please come and ask any questions you'd like and see your downstairs. Yes, John. Well, in some longer versions of this talk, uh, there's one important uh, protest against uh, Vietnam, which didn't get into this version, but it involves the uh, Elizabeth Sattler herself, your own courage and your own, you were out there as part of the protest. And that's part of the story, even if you didn't get into this version yet. Well, I think uh, there was an allusion to it. We can leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, John. Thank you. They, can read, the book. Thank you. they yeah. can read the book. You can read the book, right. That's right. Yes. This is just a tiny question. Why do you think she chose Wilson Pickett? I have a suggestion. I know he died in an airplane accident, but was it before or after that? Before? That's a very good question. Um, obviously, he's somebody whose music she liked very much, and he's African American and part of Motown. But I'll have to look up the date of his. The, yeah, and that could be a memorial. But I don't know the date. I'll look that up. Thank you. Is there any other questions now? Yes. It's a very good time. Oh, right here. Yeah, on permanent view. Thanks to Elizabeth Sackler. Don't miss it. Yeah. It's on view with. Uh, it's about 10 feet to your left. You're in for a treat, and it's a beautiful new installation by a woman architect. It's gorgeous. Yeah. I just want to say that this was the most illuminating lecture and an introduction. To, I can't wait to get inside and just not look at the surface of all these loose like things and read more about it and get the book. Thank and thank you very much. Anybody else? Okay, thank you for coming, and please, look on the door.